Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Play and Pretend with me, Chris McIlvenny. This week I am joined by one half of Grimes and McKee, Connor Grimes. He's an absolute lovely fella. I've worked with him before and it's always been a pleasure. So uh, enjoy this one. This is Connor Grimes. Connor Grimes, thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. How you doing? I'm the very best, Chris. I'm in, in the heart of Tyrone here and it's so beautiful. Yeah, loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> uh, no, no reason, no reason. Sure, it doesn't matter where you are these days. You're locked up in the house anyway, so... Uh, well, you have nicer views to look out at, I'm sure. Well, no, I live inside a village. Okay. of beautiful views just around the corner, but actually I'm looking at village houses and, you know, smoke coming out of chimneys and... Well, it might as well be up in West Belfast. That's it. You wish you were, bet you. <laughs> Uh, so normally I, I start this by saying how we first met. We first met in the Opera House. It was uh, it's, it's about seven years ago. It was when uh, yourself and Alan were doing It's a Wonderful Life, so it is, in the Opera House. And uh, I'd met Tony Devlin at a show once and asked him, could I do a bit of work experience? And he went, yeah, meet me at the Opera House at this time and this day. Had no idea what I was doing and then walked in and seen Grimes and McKee sitting there and I was like, oh shit, what's happening? And I like interrupted the rehearsals. It was very daunting, but that was a great experience for me because I, I did like the, the props and the wigs and all that jazz. So that was great. Great fun. Yeah, so I, yeah, I remember that well. We were we were fighting with Tony during that show. Mm -hmm. There's lots of fights, you remember? Yeah. I was, I was like, like is this what it's like? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not what it's like. It was um, it can sometimes be like that. But what you have to do in any situation like that is just remember uh, fight back and enjoy it. You know, I mean, sometimes that happens. That's it because you because they're all fighting for the same thing. You want the best possible outcome for the production. So it wasn't a case of it was disagreements for the sake of disagreements. It was ar artistic differences and whatever it was. And, and you've always worked it out and it came up with a, a great play. It was great. Well, that, that's the thing. It's like, um, so acting and indeed sometimes putting on shows is a very coarse art. And it reminds me sometimes of like being in a football team or something. And it can be robust. It's different when, with, with every different company and different people that you work with. But sometimes it can be, you know, you can, there can be a few knocks involved and it can be rough and tumble. But it's never personal. As soon as the rehearsals are over, you must go to the pub and have a pint or That's have it. a coffee or whatever. Because any production meetings we had, it was almost like a business meeting. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you all want the same outcome to put on the best show you can. And uh, there's a few arguments along the way. So that's, that's we're, we're human at the end of the day. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I wanted to start by asking you, uh, were you always into acting? Were you always funny at, at a young age? How did that come about, getting into that? I, 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 was, um, I was a performer at primary school. Indeed, my, my primary school is, is just around the corner from here. And I remember, you know, I mean, I remember years later, I did a show and this woman came up to me and it was my former P1 teacher. And she said to me, I'll never forget your first day in school. <laughs> and I said, whoa, I don't like this. And she goes, I asked everybody in the class on the first day how they got to school. And such and such walked down the school bray with their mummy and daddy and such and such was dropped off in the car and such and such came on the bus but Connor Grimes came on a magic carpet. <laughs> she said, that was your first words in class. And she says, this one's worth a watching. And so that, I, you know, I was not cognizant of what I was saying. Mm -hmm. I just told a big massive lie and everybody laughed, including yeah. her. And then that went right on through to P7. And in P7, it was P6 and P7, we were in the same class. And I famously made up songs and um, wrote poems. And whenever the teacher said, has anybody got a poem or, you know, we used to have rain breaks and stuff, you'd have to get up and sing and all this sort of stuff. And to this day, again, I would meet people who were in that class and they would say, do you mind the day you did this? And do you mind the day you said that? Do you remember the time that happened? Remember you were up on the table and I have sort of vague memory of some of it, but obviously I was an entertainer. 
But my sisters went to elocution and I was, uh, I refused it. And I said to my mother, not a hope am I going to elocution. And I avoided and avoided and avoided. And then when I was 14, the local theatre company, the Bardic Theatre Company, just formed and their first show was Oliver. And Sean Floon, the director, was casting for it. And he was looking for an artful dodger. And he said to my mum, who's his cousin, your son is the artful dodger, actually is in real life. Is there any chance we could get him for an addition? And she says, no, not a hope, not a hope. And he says, well, we'll have to think of something. So he says, on Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, send you him over to the club on a, on a ruse. I'll take care of the rest. And it was snowing. And uh, I remember going over to the youth club. It was when the th rehearsals were. And going in through the door. And as soon as I walked through the door, he just shouted, Conor Grimes, get up here now this minute. And I just walked up. And he says, can you read? And I says, yeah. And he goes, read that. And that was the, the long and the short of it. I got roped into it, and uh, or rather got snared or fished into it, and um, that was it from then on. I, I got, as soon as I walked out on stage on the first night, that was it. I knew I was going to be an actor. You caught the bug. Caught the bug, aye. That's it. Uh, it's, a, so, it's a vocation. It absolutely is. Uh, I always say to people, because my mum and dad, they, they were always very supportive of me and what I wanted to do, because when, I, like... I've went through a load of different phases. Like up until I was eight, I wanted to be the Pope. Uh, <laughs> not a priest, not a bishop, the Pope. I want, want to be top dog. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, and now I am not really religious at all. So it makes no sense. It's an eight year old me would be crying. Uh, but it, it was just, it's something that it, it's a, it's a need, not a want. It's mm -hmm. you, you, and you need to do it. You need to need to do it, if that makes sense. It's one of those things that's just, it's embedded in you and that's, you need to do whatever you can to make it happen for yourself. So then, did, mm -hmm. did, did, did you then go, did you study acting or, or drama uh, after secondary school? Well, what happened then was, um, again, my mother seems to be the architect of this. And, to this day, I remember my father being really disappointed in, in one way because I only really found out after that, you know, they wanted me to go on and actually go to university and have a real life in, in, in one way. But she found this thing in the Irish News, auditions for the National Youth Theatre in London, and they were holding auditions in Belfast. And she set me up for, with an audition, and again, I did not know anything about it until I got a letter through the post to say, you have an audition in two weeks time, you've got to prepare a Shakespeare and a contemporary. And so that was that. I went to the audition and got accepted into it and then went to the National Youth Theatre and then went every summer and every Easter. And they're a really brilliant organization, absolutely the, one of the greatest organizations. And so I was involved in that right up until I was 21. Um, and meantime, I went to Queen's to do English and I was involved with the drama society there. And I was toying with the idea of drama school, but Ed Wilson, God rest him, who was the boss of the National Youth Theatre said, you don't need to go to drama school. You've sort of done, all, you've been in this place for so long. You're not gonna learn really anything new. So you're fine to go and finish off your degree, which was good advice. Mm -hmm. it's, it's weird, I like doing a, something like National Youth Theatre, that was obviously was that in london you went mm -hmm. over um because it, it's very strange that there's no drama school here mm -hmm. uh in really any capacity like a, a vocational training course um it, it's strange that, that there's not considering the amount of actors the amount of talent that is in this wee place and there's there's nothing for them to, to they, they you kind of are forced to go away to England or, and, and do whatever you can. Well, there's, um, there's drama at, at Queen's now, of course. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's hard to get into. Yeah, because I remember I had, my mum always wanted me to do drama at Queen's, but you needed three Bs mm -hmm. in, in your A-levels, and I was never really academic. And then I had an audition for a school in Newcastle, and they were like, you need a C in drama to get in. And I was like, well, I'm not working really hard to try and get three Bs to stay in my childhood home with you 
I'm going to Newcastle. I've stopped work in school and just gave up all my school work and just went, right, well, I only need to see in drama. I'm going to get that. So I had the best time in uh, the last year of school. It just didn't really do any um, school work. What about Newcastle? Some town, isn't it? Ah, oh, unbelievable. It, and it's crazy going over, like being from here, obviously, the nightlife, like you're going to the same clubs from your 15th. So uh, same bars and stuff. So you know everyone. And then you go to Newcastle. I went to Newcastle as an 18 year old. And all I knew of it was like Geordie Shore. It was that mm. TV show. It was just chaos. And every time my mum rang, she'd be like, listen, I hope it's nothing like that Geordie Shore. I was like, no, not at all. It was 100% <laughs> like Geordie Shore. It was crazy. <laughs> People fall about the street, paralytic. I was like, oh, I love this. It was brilliant. So was it when you were in Queens that you met Al McKee? Yes, it was. We were both members of the Drama Society, but we were in rival um, theatre companies. Oh. And we were enemies. Um, we're frenemies more than enemies. Yeah. It was um, There were two theatre companies doing the scene at that stage. One was called Sightlines, and that had a, a, a lot of Queen's um, drama students, and, and, they, and they set it up, and he was involved with them, quite po-faced, and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, Sightlines. Or not. And then we set up a rival company called Gauntlet. Oh, yeah. And Gauntlet were the opposite. We were throwing down the Gauntlet Irish Theatre. We only lasted 18 months. <laughs> um, and, and there was a sort of like a, a mini rivalry in Belfast. You know, if we saw them, we'd be like, you know, f- you wouldn't go to one of their shows. <laughs> and they would say, like, you wouldn't go to one of their shows. They're crap. You know, so that was that. But what happened was, we became friends, of course, and then um, we, uh, I think we did a show together in the Arts Theatre uh, before there was a, a one a, a comedy night organised for the Belfast Festival at Queen's. Mm-hmm. And Colin Murphy and Alan and Tim Lone and a number of others were involved in it. And Conleth Hill had to drop out. And Tim phoned me up and said, look, Conleth Hill has dropped out of this comedy thing. Would you step in and do it? And I said, well, I don't do comedy. I'm, I'm a proper actor. And he goes, no, no, you're, you're funny. You're really funny. You really are. You should do it. And I goes, no, I couldn't do comedy. I honestly couldn't. And I said, I'm not doing it. I said, I got a, I had a sort of a bit of a, a fear, you know. Mm-hmm. I just thought, this isn't a play. And I, I, you know, I like a play where I can learn my lines and I can do that and I don't want to go into that place but McKay called around to my house and he said oh, come on Dick. come on it's a bit of crack I swear he says you've only got four sketches to do you've got lines and you'll be fine so I went and I did it and after the whole thing was over really enjoyed it Tim said you two you two you only did one sketch together but there's something about you two I think you should do a show together and then we did our first show in the uh, Old Museum Art Centre called um, Panto is Arse, Buttons Hole. And it was a <laughs> sketch show. And it was a sketch show for grown-ups, a Christmas show for grown-ups. And I think we were the first people really to do that. I know Mary Jones was in and around the same time, either unbeknownst to us and, and so on, but it was she was at it and we were at it. And of course it packed out, even though it's only a small venue, because people went... Christmas for mummy and daddy. Christmas for the lads. Absolutely. Christmas nights out and stuff, staff yeah. days. We'll go see it's a wee now, play before we go. Absolutely. And it's now oh, de rigueur. Every, every theatre does it. Yeah. Uh, but they're not, they don't do it all over the UK or America or anywhere like that. It's almost, almost not exclusive to Belfast, but Belfast definitely are, are leaders in it. Mm-hmm. Because uh, so, how, how long ago would that have been that you did your first Christmas oh, show? My God, a uh, thirty. I'm fifty two. So would would we have been? I can't. I honestly can't remember. A long time I, ago. <laughs> a right while ago. Twenty two yeah, years, say twenty two years right. ago. And it's crazy to think that you have kept doing it. And, and so wh- wh- how did it come about? Like, did you use wrote the sketches and stuff like that? And then, so sorry, go on. 
well, we wrote them and some other people wrote, Tim Lone wrote, wrote some and Stephen Wright so, wrote some for that first one. Mm-hmm. And then after that, we just wrote them all ourselves. And then did you know that obviously you just had that chemistry on stage, uh, you and McKee, but did just uh, the writing partnership, how, how did you just decide to then write a story like The History of the Troubles? Well, we started writing... Well, the History of Troubles came about because we had done a show in Belfast called, um, it was actually for the festival again, and it was in the Crescent Art Centre. Mm-hmm. And it was called um, The Dogs on the Street. And it was just a sketch show, you know, it was just this, we have a few characters, Uncle Birdie, the Spides, the Pulchies, you know, these different, different bog standard sketches. Mm-hmm. Bit of crack, nothing more, but Martin Lynch was at it and he came up afterwards. And says, let me be the painter. It's me. This funny suit was. And so we went, ah, good, good stuff and all the rest. But he followed it up with, um, look, he says, I have an idea for, of writing with you. And I've got a bit of funding to do a project on Rathlin Island. So he says, why don't we try and see, can we do that? And if we can do that, then we'll, we'll, we'll try a bigger project. So we wrote a history of, we knew it was going to be a history of the Troubles, but so we wrote a history of Rathlin Island. The history of a very small island off the north coast of Ireland was the title of it. And we wrote it and we went over to Rathlin Island and um, we performed it. And, but we were slagging them off. So we were going, what are we doing on an island slagging off these people? <laughs> we throw us over the cliffs. And we were sort of shiting them, pardon my French, but... <laughs> We really were. I remember Jordan taking a big beamer going, I was like crazy about these mad islanders. But of course they loved it and mm-hmm. everything was fine and dandy. And we went back and we wrote the history of the troubles. But, you know, we had been writing sketch shows before that and we've, and we've written a lot of stuff after that. And we were just right together. But that was a project writing with Martin. Mm-hmm. Trickier it's, project. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I, I, I like, I went to see the history of the troubles sort of at that. I was in secondary school, and as part of like a GCSE drama, you have to go see a certain amount of theatre. Mm-hmm. And then I was going out with a girl who was the drama teacher's daughter. So uh, all these the people in a couple of years above me were going to see the play, and then she was like, "Here, someone can't go to the play. Would you like to go?" And at that stage, like I did drama for GCSE, but never really wanted to be an actor. I went to see that show and just, it blew me away. And Fireball, it, all you had was 15 kids from uh, Ralph Moore doing Fireball impressions and doing the voice. And I was like, oh my God, like it, it just, it stuck out to me because it was such a, a, a unique format that I'd never seen before. Like two actors playing so many different roles and then that one main character mm-hmm. that the story follows and you are just the, the, all the wacky characters in between. Um, mm-hmm. Did you know when you wrote it that it was going to be as successful as it, as it ended up being? Again, there was, there was plenty of fights during that. Mm-hmm. Plenty of, you know, like, kapow, you know, like, cartoon fights. Yeah. Our director was a guy called Carl Wallace. And Carl Wallace was um, an English fellow who was in Belfast and was an eccentric type of person but um, in, in certain ways, but absolutely gifted with physical theater. So he, he put his stamp on it mm-hmm. and that's where it changed. We had written a piece which was a wee bit all over the show. There were some elements that were very good in it and there were some elements, elements that, that, that you know, needed work. But Carl came in and he started, he says, no, just you know, to change character, just put one hand in your pocket and everyone will know if you do that for the first two times, everyone will know the minute you do that, this is this new character and they'll go with it. He says, they'll, they'll, they'll go with it. So he began his physical stuff and it's all very, very simple when you watch it. Mm-hmm. But of course it's like a cartoon. There's 200 frames and you, you've them all broken down and you know exactly what you're doing and you've rehearsed it inside out. So it becomes this beautiful thing to watch. And it is very, very simple when you break down all, all its little tiny bits. So we didn't really know what we had. 
And in fact, the open, <laughs> I think it was the opening night, we did it in a in a 100 seater place in the in Waring Street, a bank that was converted into a theater for a festival, the Cathedral Quarter Festival, the Cathedral Quarter Arts Festival. They commissioned the show. Right. And uh, so it just goes to show again about commissionings. They took a they took a punt and they they commissioned it. And we were then able to pay them back over the years. Yeah. As a wee thank you. For for commissioning the show once we get into the opera house with it. In, in terms of sorry, in terms of commissioning, like how does um do you just tell them the the a brief what you're kind of gonna write, and then they give you money to do it, or how does that work? Well, well the way commissioning works is a theatre company will have a certain amount of money to put on shows either a theatre company that's commercial or a theatre company that's funded almost exclusively by the Arts Council. So, yeah, you get to know the people involved. And um, if you have a great idea or a strong idea that you really believe in, you can approach them and you can say to them, look, we have a great idea. We think this is a great idea. What do you think? And you begin the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And if they want to go for it, and again, they'll be just thinking, you know, commercially about this and whether or not it's going to be successful because they've got to make it work. You've got to put the bums on seats, you know. So there, there's where we're at. So if they say, yeah, I think it might work, it's a good idea, then they, yes, they pay you a certain amount to retain your services. Mm -hmm. And your job then is to go and write the play and you've got all the deadlines coming. on. <laughs> You know, the, the, as Marco Pierre White, the famous chef, said, without fear, no discipline. You know, so you got that whip cracking and, and you get paid in installments as you provide the drafts. Right. And, and so that's kind of how it works. And, and with writing, do you prefer writing with a deadline in mind or, or, or in your spare time? Like over this lockdown, have you been writing stuff? Is that kind of something you do? No. No, no. I, I I always write to deadlines and to to with, with an end in mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, writing in a vacuum is not something that sort of interests me. Mm -hmm. Although, having said that, I will write down. I'll, I'll write some poems if they come to my mind, purely for my own pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, perhaps they will be discovered after my demise. And, yeah. Uh, my my grandchildren will be millionaires, but I very <laughs> very much doubt it. So usually we're writing to order with an end in mind mm -hmm. that we're going to be performing it. And the other thing about it is, is that's not the only way, of course, to get shows up and running. Again, I mentioned Mary Jones earlier. She famously said, "Opportunity doesn't do home visits." So it's back to what you said about the need that you have to do this. You've also got to be proactive and you've got to eke out and search out and book an old hall here and get a few people together and write something and get it up and running and put it and don't worry about failing and you know don't fear that, that it's going to be terrible. That you said about the history of the troubles. We thought, we honestly thought, what the, is this? What are we doing? And we did the first night and a hundred people all went up off their feet like that. And of course, the guy from the opera house then came to see it. And we were talking to him afterwards. And we said, well, why do you think it would work in the opera house? There's only 100 people here. And he says, yes, but all 100 people laughed at the same time. All 100 people clapped at the same time. And they all stood up at the same time. And he says, a thousand people will do it exactly the same. And, and, and so that was, his vision was, it's a Belfast play. And again, at that stage, there weren't many Belfast players in the opera house who were touring companies coming in mm -hmm. now belfast players are in the opera house constantly yeah, yeah. It's, and, uh, and, you know, not claiming to be a trailblazer but it just goes to show you know what can be done mm -hmm. absolutely so uh you mentioned mary jones you did a few years back a night in november mm -hmm. now obviously uh, a, a lot of you do a lot of work with with mckee but mm -hmm. A one-man show is very different. What, what, what was it like for you to, to do a night in November and having that whole show on your shoulders? Um, well, that, did that, you enjoy it? 
enjoy is not the is enjoy. Uh, I'm stammering now because it was it was quite an experience. And then again, you know, I do a lot of work with Alan, and we're we're known for that. We also do a lot of work separately, which is probably why we continue to work together mm -hmm. because we get breaks from each other and we're able to come back to the table with new experiences, having worked with new people and all that sort of stuff. And so we don't have an overload. But in that particular instance, I remember two things. At one stage, learning the show, I was waking up in the middle of the night with alphabet soup, like, you know, floating around in front of me, words, letters, everything, trying to grasp them. Because it's quite daunting, the thought of learning all of this stuff by yourself. You've all looked at somebody to dig you out of trouble on a stage or whatever, or to give you a wee look. Um, and the second thing was, I didn't like being in the, I wasn't used to being in the dressing room by myself. Mm -hmm. It was always, the camaraderie of our job is incredible. All you do, do one show with somebody and they're your friend for life. Yeah. That's where everybody knows each other and we're all like some sort of brotherhood and, and sisterhood. Um, but I had nobody then, except I was saved by my stage management team. Mm -hmm. And I ended up just getting dressed and going and sitting with them. Yeah. Um, so we had the crack and we had the fun and, and it wasn't as lonesome. But I didn't like I didn't like that. No. Being on your own. Stand up comedy is a bit like that. Yeah. Um, see, I, I always I, I always find that uh, one man plays interesting, but uh, in terms of the actual performances, was there any enjoyment had doing the actual show? Maybe not in the uh, like on the tour or whatever it was, but it performing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, that's where I did enjoy it, mm -hmm. really. And what I enjoyed, I really loved rehearsals. Ian McElhenney directed it, and he was so chilled out and so relaxed. He was, he never. He's a, an amazing character. He doesn't get ruffled, and he doesn't get angry, and he, he just doesn't get any of those things that you're so used to when you're working with some other people mm -hmm. that are like you know, he's just. Mr. Chill and it'll all click into place and he's right I really enjoyed that and of course the play itself is very moving so every night on stage when the character is beginning to see around him and wake up to the fact that things aren't as he thought they were it's a real journey and it's really well written and you get this real sort of elation by doing it and you get emotionally sucked into it as a performer so I enjoyed all that really enjoyed all that just didn't like being by myself yeah fair <laughs> Uh, so then, um, then you were in Dancing Shoes, the George Best musical. Now, were you always a singer? I know you play guitar, but were you always a, a singer? I would, I'm a fairly, you know, below average singer. And in fact, that was all, you know, for me to be in a musical, I have been in musicals and I've sung, I can, I can just hold a note, but I've got a sort of unpleasant voice, uh, you know. It's not, I'm, you know, you know singers. I don't know, Connor. Like uh, the two shows that I worked on with you, you sang in both of them. You play guitar in both of them and sang in both of them, and you were really good. Well, I'm, 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 I'm certainly some of the singers that you come across are brilliant singers, like Terry mm -hmm. Keeley and Ali Jenkins and all these, and Marty McGuire. They're brilliant singers. So that's what I'm up against. But I actually had to do a, a vocal test for that show. Right. So I had to go and sing <laughs> and sing with the musical directors and um, just because they knew that I was I was there to do the some of the, the comic parts not so much the comic parts but I was there to bring a different sort of element to the show mm -hmm. um, and they just wanted to make sure 100% so I went uh, to the top floor of the Europa Hotel and in fact, it was the Fitzwilliam Hotel and sang, sang to them. And I remember halfway during the song, saying one of them going, <sighs> and I walked out and I went, oh, God, <laughs> <laughs> knocked him out there. But he was only doing that because he was going, I, I think if you can sing, all right. He wanted to, he told me afterwards, after my first two bars, he just went, oh, yeah, he's fine. He can sing. So I, they wanted to know, could I do harmonies and, you know, yeah. I wasn't going to be singing any big songs in it. Yeah. Kerry Quinn and Cole. You know? mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so. See, well, that, that, like a show like that is such a, a difference from doing 
and like November by yourself, like that's such a a community piece, like mm-hmm. or a company piece. Sorry, and like with with so many other actors, uh, like I, I can just imagine the crack that was had during that. Crack was great, absolutely brilliant. It was it was Packy Lee and Matthew McElhenney and Marty McGuire, and we were you know we were we were ensemble actors, and it was just really really excellent, mm-hmm. really excellent. So um. Obviously, you've done so much work here uh, and you're so widely known here, but uh, have you ever thought of or have you ever uh, went away to like England or America to, to, to try your hand, maybe when you were younger or anything? No, I didn't. And in fact, I remember when I was leaving the youth theatre coming back home, they were saying, you know, I have fr- friends over there in London. And I just said, like, you know, this isn't this isn't for me. And I just knew it wasn't for me. I, I am actually a home bird. I live in Donald Moore, you know, and I, I travel to wherever I go. And, and, you know, you just have to know what makes what makes you happy. And ultimately, you have to, you, have, you just have to follow your instincts. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with going away and, and, and have lots of friends that, that do, but there's nothing wrong with staying where you are either. Yeah. It can kind of come to you. And it's, I don't my advice to anybody in the business that's younger as well. Don't stress it. It'll it'll work out. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, obviously you've done some TV and film and obviously a lot of theatre. Which do you prefer? Theatre is the... Uh, theatre is better paid. You know, it's a, it's, it's more, it's more real. You go to work, you go there, you can do a show and you can be in a show for 10 weeks, 12 weeks, longer. Especially if you're involved with producing it and all the rest, there's more satisfaction. It's very hands-on. <clears throat> you've got a live audience that react. So you've all of those positives. And when I say it's better paid, I just mean that it's bums on seats. People have fantasy island stuff about TV and, and film. You're there for one day, two days, a couple of days. And pay it accordingly, you know, some, some a lot of the times. And you can be have a decent part in the film. And you're actually only engaged for a couple of days. Yeah. Whereas in theater, you're engaged for weeks and weeks and weeks. So it's different in that sense. Um, but there's you know, there's something about being in a in a good film or a, a good TV series or whatever, you know, it's a different type of performance. You've got to internalize everything, you, you don't show anything. You know, the camera is going to watch you, whereas you're complete pulling faces on stage. Mm-hmm. So you've got to change things around. So, yeah, uh, and I, I love both, but I'm more used to theatre, obviously. Mm-hmm. And with theatre, you get that instant almost gratification from the audience. You get that yeah. immediate response. And, like, obviously that's not why we do what we do, but it helps. Getting yeah. that praise, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, I need it. I needed that for my ego a little bit. So, thanks. Yeah, tell me more how good I was. It's well, like when you first did your first show, and the audience reacted to you. Was that not food like to your soul? Absolutely, it was because yeah. it's interesting. Like, because rehearsals, um, it in rehearsals it doesn't feel like you're performing in a way. You're kind of uh, working out how to make it a, a performance uh, obviously you do runs of whatever the uh, you're working on is you do runs of it but it never really feels like performance because the director's seen it whoever stays behind and has seen it a million times knows the script inside out so then when you it's the first time you get in front of an audience who haven't seen it before and you're like ah oh, all the hard work that we did in rehearsals have been worthwhile because you just love me. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is what I do. How could they like, not? How could yeah. they not? <laughs> Throwing roses at you. Loving it. Um, so, yeah, uh, recently you and McKay did uh, some Mongos and you yeah. toured around all the GAA clubs. And uh, uh, when you were younger, did you play GAA? I did. I did play. Did. I'm one of those that for, falls into the class of legend. Oh, really? Who stand, stands at the bar saying, oh, I could have played for Tyrone or only, a, you know, I twisted my 
knee camp and you know this that, and the other so I, I played yes I played up until I was 18 and I broke my arm and I played for Donald Moore seniors but I, I broke my arm at school and that was a year out and during that year out I found drama <laughs> yeah and I, I didn't really I, I, I was look I wasn't bad but I wasn't great yeah. football I wasn't I wasn't going to be a a top footballer but I did play my brothers all played and my cousins all played, my dad played, and everybody around us and, and, the, and the club. So I know everything about a club yeah. and how a club is run and how it all works. And that's where St. Mungo's came from. Yeah. And McKee knows about rugby and what we were able to do in that, the project once we started writing with that element. I was able to provide some glimpses from behind the curtain. But of course, we work as a team. And he was able to pull them out of me and work with them. And we were writing away. And he was able to go, no, that's too much detail. Nobody's bored in now. And so on. And we got it up and running. So they created this fictional club, the worst football club in Ireland. Yeah. In the world, in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it, it's so interesting because you went on to around all the different GA clubs. Like I, I seen twice in uh, my GA clubs, uh, Lav Jarg in Hannestown. And uh, it's so funny because everyone finds it absolutely hilarious because they can see the different characters in the <laughs> in the club. And they're like looking around like, Jesus, it seems like you used to have been sitting in on the AGM meetings and, and, and have been at uh, the bar after the one championship like those people are so but they're in every club it's so funny yes. well that's the point and you, sometimes with writing you just have to get one place or one person or whatever right and everyone will recognize it because as you say we didn't really know they were in every club but everywhere we went afterwards people would say hi they'd always go that's like them it's like the club up the road, so it is. Yeah. You never admit it was them. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's like that's like them up the road, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, or people would say, Well, you did you put up CCTV cameras around here? Because yeah. you know the, the various characters in it, but but a Gaelic football club or a Gaelic hurling club or, or a Gaelic athletic club is a place for and, and it applies with every club. I have you know soccer rugby, basketball, etc. There's a place in it for the marginalised and the people that don't necessarily get to shine in, in normal aspects of society. They get to be high profile people within a G and the small fiefdom that is a Gaelic football club. So you can be a shelf stacker at the supermarket, but vice chairman yeah. of St Mungo's. Yeah. And you everyone know, knows you. You can be driving down the road and everyone's beating their horn. Be like, oh, yeah, I know him from the club. He never misses a match. He's like, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's him. Like, like, there's boys stand at the sidelines every match, no teeth in their head. And they're just exactly. the characters that you, everyone loves. It's so funny. And uh, that's what the GAA does. It provides something for them, you know. Absolutely. So, um, obviously, uh, during this time, it's uh, tough to plan for the future, but what are your hopes? What What are you hoping when everything opens up? What What are you hoping to to do? Uh, I don't know. I don't have any real coming plans to be honest with you. We'll just um, we had just um, written a show which was a spin-off of St Mungo's called The Real Rules of Gaelic, mm -hmm. and and it's about referees because we realised that the most marginalised figure of all, and mm -hmm. and certainly in Gaelic Gaelic. Yeah is the referee, you know, like a fat priest in goddies <laughs> out there. And it's just like, and I, I remember one, one night we were, my local club was playing our local rivals in a, a big game and it was in their ground. And, I, I, you know, there was a big crowd there and there, in the middle of it, there was an actual thunder and lightning storm. Well, lightning cracking about the place. It was like King Lear. And I counted at one stage, there were, inside the fence, there were 35, I would say about 35 of them. And there were about 35 of us men. So 70 men in total in there. Players, officials, subs, 
you know, whatever. And you're only a certain amount allowed in. And they were all in this cage. And there was one wee fat priest and goodies running around in the middle of it and a thunderstorm. And I just went, how is he supposed to control this? Madness. Rivals. Yeah. And you know, you know yourself, it's like, you know, and I, but so we, we wrote, we wrote that show, The Real Rules of Gaelic, and we performed it for one night in Lurgan, um, in a, I think the clans that were, I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head, but it was in Lurgan anyway, and um, that was our opening night in St. Francis' school, actually, and uh, that was the 13th of March. Crazy. And three days later, lockdown, 16th mm -hmm. of March. Yeah. And so, so we have that, we have that sitting. Yeah. And I think that our, our sort of plan is that as soon as things change, if, if they do, or when they do, sorry, of course they will, we can do that for a little while to get ourselves back up and running and, and get our get our heads back into the game and, and we'll see what happens after that. Yeah, if there's going to be a Christmas or not, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, Connor, to finish off, uh, what advice, you, you have actually given some pieces of advice already, but what advice would you give for any actors, writers uh, that are already in the industry or looking to get into it? What do you advise them? Well, just like you had said, I think that, you know, and, and it applies for parents as well, um, if your young and is interested in it, it's got to be a vocation. It really helps if it's a vocation, because if it's not, there are too many knocks um, and too many rejections. You know, most people, if they do a job interview and get rejected, they're shell shocked for about a year. We have job interviews every week. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and even when you get to, you know, I remember some famous actors who you would know when I would talk to occasionally. They're still auditioning. Don't be fooled. They're not sitting reading scripts, deciding what to do. They're putting themselves out there and they're having to audition and, and so on. So you've got to be resilient. You've got to have a thick skin. Don't worry too much about things. Get yourself back up off the canvas like Muhammad Ali's opponent there and, and, and get fighting again. Opportunity doesn't do home visits. Be proactive. Get involved with people. Don't wait on the phone to ring. Keep, just keep on rolling and rolling and enjoying it and it'll all work out and it's, it's yep. like <laughs> that that's my advice and I enjoy it it's a brilliant job mm -hmm. well thank you very much Connor it's been an absolute pleasure having you thanks for uh, taking the time out to, to speak to me I appreciate it no problem Chris a pleasure so you have it folks that was Connor Grimes join me next week when I am joined by Diona Doherty so funny and such a legend. She's so talented as well. So tune in next week for that. If you could, tell your friends about the podcast. Like and subscribe to the video. This has been Play and Pretend with Chris McIlvenny. See you next week.